This week on The Real Watchlist Plus, we're doing the D.W. Griffith film Broken Blossoms, the silent film from 1919. Broken Blossoms from 1919. A frail waif, Lillian Gish, abused by her brutal boxer fathers in London's seedy Limehouse district, is befriended by a sensitive Chinese immigrant, which leads to tragic circumstances. Now, this doesn't sound politically correct, but it is part of it. It's based on the short story, The Chink and the Child, by Thomas Burke, which was part of his Limehouse Night series. Flip. What? Ah! No! Amunai! No! Can I reach over and paddle you? I... The main character, the main actor, Chen Wan. In the beginning scene, you see him talking to his mentor, right. or a spiritual guy, talking about how he wants to spread love and the philosophy of Buddhism, the religion of Buddhism, to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. He then travels to London and finds that it's not all that it's cracked up to be, that love... And in essence, the, the fact that he's of a different religion than the majority of the people there really puts him at odds. And he ends up working in a small shop. A man with such hope has turned into a man with such despair. And you see him very meek, very cowered away from society. But he runs into Lucy, Lucy Barrows. Now, Lucy is having such a terrible time. She portrays, she's a 15-year-old girl. And you don't really know that watching it. You're kind of like figuring it out. Because for me, when I was watching it, I'm thinking, you know, she's in a home, like an apartment, not a home, but an apartment with an older person. Yeah, you, you I later found sure. They don't really say, no, they like, don't. you know, kind of like, this is the father, this is the daughter. Because I'm thinking maybe it's a husband-wife kind of thing. Yeah, because they married younger girls back then, right. too. And Lillian Gish was older. She was 27 when she took on this role, playing a 15-year-old. Yeah. So you're looking at her, she does look very young, but I'm thinking, okay, it's a husband and wife kind of situation. Later to find out that, no, it's father and daughter living on their own. You don't know much about what's, why they're in that situation, but he abuses her severely. Battling Burroughs, father, he's a, he's a prize fighter, he's a boxer. You know, he's just treating his daughter with such anger and, and rage, and she can't cook right, she can't do anything right. At one point, she, after one of these episodes, she leaves. She doesn't know where to go, and she ends up falling into Jen's shop, only to be discovered by him, and he brings her to his second-level apartment. The store was on the bottom. It was beautiful, but it was awkward at the same time, this kind of relationship going on. Uh, knowing that she was 15 years old and he was older, I'm thinking, okay, is this a period thing where that kind of a relationship would have been acceptable. But do you or, think I mean, we think that way, or you think that way because of what we think modern thinking? Do you think audiences were thinking that way? Or were they thinking he was just sweet and a religious man well, and kind? Well, okay, so... But I was I, always thinking in the background, you know, what's yeah, he, is, he about? is he an opportunist? Yeah, is he trying yeah. to, like, take advantage of her? Mm -hmm. Because there's some scenes where you see, and he does such a great job, Richard, Bar I'm going to mispronounce his name, my apologies. Richard uh, Barthelmess. Richard Barthelmess. Uh, he does such a great job in acting very meek, very, and but also trying to portray that sense of emotion, that love, but very subtle and sweet. Right. But, Plus he has kind of a beautiful face. Right, right. Which lends to it. If he looked like, you know, Marty Feldman, it would be like <laughs> insane looking. Okay, folks who don't know Marty Feldman, oh, let's show up. you a picture, all right? Look him up. Because any Gen Zers won't know who Marty Feldman is. Maybe millennials might. But at some points he kind of comes into her space. Like he's really getting almost nose to nose. And even Lillian Gish, as she's acting the role of Lucy, she's acting like, wait a minute, are you getting too close here? What are your real intentions? He refrains. It's almost like, I want to, but I can't because I shouldn't. Right. You're getting that. Well, his tense male moment. young nature is coming out, but he's a holy man as well. Correct. So for that, I could appreciate the film, but at the same time, I'm like, this is awkward. I'm not feeling. Between the brutalization of the character of Lucy, by her father between this very awkward male-female kind of love, but what kind of love is it? Right. Relationship. It really didn't make me feel comfortable. But then again, maybe movies are supposed to make you feel that way to give you that. And if, they, and if a movie can portray that, then maybe it's, it's doing what it's supposed to. 
she falls asleep, he falls asleep, she wakes up the next day. Now think about it. If you're a 15 year old and you're not home by Especially by with the brute that's a father. Especially with the brute that's a father. Of course, now the father is in a rage. Where's my daughter? What's going on? So, and these all, these side characters, these like gossipers, these like- Snitches. Evil, yeah, snitches. Little snitches evil, in evil the people store. people also were portrayed in this movie and they finding the daughter in his apartment. Now he, he walked away at one point, so he wasn't there to see it happen. She gets dragged home. He follows her, figures out where she is, only to find out that she had been brutally beaten and died. So he kills the father out of revenge, now a loving man, pacifist, is now killing someone. It's like an Amish person doing it, almost. Right. Shoots him, goes back to the apartment. Now they discover, all these people are discovering, oh, he's been killed, what am I doing? Let's, let's go get him, let's go get the Chinaman. Yeah. Um, only to find out that he ends up killing himself. Commit suicide. Yeah. So he completely, you know, his whole character and his whole belief system was destroyed. And I guess they made it seem that that's all he really could do because he couldn't face his own right. psyche. I like this part of our show now. So while you're watching um, Broken Blossom, you can enjoy a cocktail of the period of time in which this took place. So today's feature, the Orange Blossom. Okay. So picture this, America, 1919. Talking about speakeasies, jazz. Talking about a time when the 18th Amendment was ratified, prohibiting alcohol. Can you believe it, folks? And then Which in made them want to drink more. Yeah, well, that's what happened. And in 1920, the enforcement of the uh, prohibition of alcohol. So that, at that time, there was a lot of illegally made gin. As you see here, we're going to have a little drink. But the bootleg gin would also be kind of harsh because they were building it in people's apartments and bathtubs. And to sort of sweeten it up, they would add fruity uh, elements to the drink. So the ingredients to this particular drink, Orange Blossom, is a one and a half ounces of gin and one and a half ounces of orange juice freshly squeezed. So it's like a gin screwdriver. Correct. If you think of a screwdriver, it's a screwdriver made with gin with an orange twist. I like that. Um, Shake Good job. It, Beautiful. Pour it. Served in a coupe glass. Do you know how this glass came into being? No. Well, first of all, the champagne glass, which is his little coupe, but it was the size of Marie Antoinette's breast. Oh. And they made a mold of Marie Antoinette's breast okay. to make the champagne glass. I didn't know that. These are the stupid things that I know that do nothing for me except be able to say it on the show. Here we go. Cheers. All right, I'm not doing Let's taste. Oh, she's got the face, folks. Okay, so I am using a less sugar orange juice because I do have diabetes, so I can't have too much sugar. So that only means you add more gin. Um, but enjoy it. It's refreshing. It's great for a brunch or for a light summery drink. You know, the original that the material, the source material, he was not like a religious Zen type sweet person that was mm -hmm. a person who observed and wanted to do well in mankind. He was a drifter from Shanghai. He was an opium, he was a thief, but then they changed him to a Buddhist monk because they didn't think American audiences would like it. They had to like clean it up because of course, remember, there's no rating system back then, but they wanted everybody and the silent films were becoming big in the theaters. It was people's escapism. So D.W. Griffith changed it and he changed it to, they thought they'd be prejudiced and they'd ban this picture themselves, the audience. So he changed them to a pacifist. You mentioned something interesting, the, the reaction from the general public when watching this film. Now, during that period of time, you saw a lot of film introducing Asian characters, not played by Asian actors. <laughs> Any of the main characters, they were played by white men or white women. Yellow peril. And they called that at the time. And it's like, we have all the DEI casting now, but they would never allow now a white to play a right. Chinese man. Right. A lot and of xenophobia. There, there was so much prejudice against it, especially you think about it today, where there was prejudice against the Chinese with COVID and, you know, communists and the war machine that China is now. So it's kind of like, in a certain way, 
you know, things are, history repeats itself. Yeah, the more things change, the more they actually stay the same. Exactly, and so. that's why you have to study history in order to know what to do mm -hmm. when things happen now. With Chen Huan, the Richard Barthelmus, who played, I have a, he actually did his own makeup, mm -hmm. but the way he made his eyes look like Chinese, he wore a giant rubber band stretched across mm -hmm. his forehead. So Limehouse, that particular area of London, was a very poor, an area where a lot of Asian people have emigrated to. So you have that mixing of the folks that are living there the, and the folks that are moving in. Sort of like what's happening with today's standards yeah. dealing with immigration. So you're getting that same kind of vibe then. The only difference now is when you live by the water, you're paying a zillion bucks. I know, there. Back like, then, you were rotten fish, crazy sailors, mm -hmm. drunken. So it's like, over time, it's kind of flip-flopped. This is labeled American cinema's first tragedy. Um, and it was remade into a 1936 talkie that they wanted uh, D.W. Griffith to do, but he didn't want to do it. Right. And it went to a hack director, John Bram. So it was just like garbage that nobody looked at. I don't know if it was garbage, but I use these cinematic terms. Um, it wasn't and, critically acclaimed. No, no one talks no. about it. It's actually, during my research, I came across it and I'm like, there's another one, and then it was just... I know, it's garbage. not even worth barely talking about it. Let's give a snippet to our audience. All right, so we're going to go to D.W., because he was a really big shot. And he was born in Kentucky, and that had a lot to do with his background. His father was a former Confederate Army colonel and a Civil War veteran. Well, do you see the pattern here mm -hmm. to a movie he made? He grew up with his father's war stories, hearing everything, and, of course, he was on the side of the South. He actually worked for the Edison Company as a porter before anything, and he was offered a job with the Mutoscope and Biograph Company, which got him in, into films. He directed 450 short films, and, of course, the biggest one that he would perfect his style would be Birth of a Nation, to this day is extremely controversial because it was mostly about the rising up of the Ku Klux Klan. And it's a great film to study. I, I, matter of fact, I took a class on it one time and it was really great. But it's a film that should be talked about, not buried. I hate when they bury movies because they think now you can't talk about them. Um, he did the flashback. Mm -hmm. that, he was the first person to do a flashback. The Irish shot of the eye, the mask and cross cutting. And in following birth, none of his other films were as successful as Birth of a Nation. And he was hailed for his narrative filmmaking, but criticized horribly for his race racism. And he was a very dichotomous filmmaker. That's my word of the day, dichotomous, which means two different sides. He saw one side and the other side and never the gray in between. So that takes you to Birth of a Nation. It takes you to the Civil War. It tells you what he thought. Mm -hmm. Also, this was the first United Artists film. And United Artists was created by Mary Pickford, Douglas Fairbanks, mm -hmm and a senior, I believe, and Charlie Chaplin. And they were becoming very powerful, especially Chaplin, because... And DW, too. Right, yes. And if you heard that noise in the background, yes, podcast folks, someone dropped something, we don't know what it yeah, was. Yeah, we don't know. We're, cover we're, there's us. other people there's filming. There's a big screen and, blocking us yes. from them. Um, another thing, this was shot entirely in a studio, which was very rare for silent films. They used out, a lot of outside locations. But they couldn't use it because back then America was so pristine. Mm -hmm. There weren't enough crummy looking places. God, I wish it was still that way to use it. And they used miniatures in this film. Which and were when, the miniatures? But, well, when they were doing the port scene and it, there's the motions of like boats or the things boats, moving, moving yeah. along, those were yeah. actual miniatures used. That's it's so one, of the, cool. one of the techniques, one of the films that used that technique. Right. Was sort of innovative at the time. Lillian Gish, first lady of American cinema, as she's been so honored with that uh, title. Uh, she spent 75 years being an actress. She started when she was extremely young. And the wonderful thing about learning more about her is there's so much available. She wrote her own books. She actually wrote a couple of books, uh, many interviews that you can find on YouTube. Um, so there is so much to admire about her. And you talk, listening to her story growing up, it was her and her older sister, uh, Dorothy Gish. Her mother was looking for work, and as she said in one interview, it was either work or be in the poorhouse, and we weren't going to be in the poorhouse. 
So my mother worked, she took us to work, and as a clerk, she would come across people in theater and was able to get her daughters as an, to be paid for an appearance in a theater play. And because of that, she got exposed to more people. Uh, matter of fact, one of the people that uh, brought her from theater to the film was actually uh, Mary Pickford, as you mentioned earlier. Right, who started United Artists. Yeah. So it was because of that relationship that took her from theatrics and working in um, theater houses across the U.S. into film. When D.W. Griffith discovered her, both of them actually, because you can't talk about Lillian unless you talk about her sister, um, discovered that th you know they had this talent. Lillian going into the movie Broken Blossoms, the scene that took place that she's so noted for is the closet scene. Right where her father is ready to beat her up, seriously beat her up. She runs into a small bathroom and there's nowhere to go. There's no windows. So her father is just beating and beating that door. They're trying to get in. He's trying to hatch it his way through. And she's in such an emotional frenzy. It's almost like a schizophrenia. She doesn't know what to do. She's trapped. And as she said in one of her interviews, she really took it upon herself to be in a hysteria to be a trapped animal, to right. try to get out. The wringing of the hands, as they talked about, and yeah. the screams. Again, you couldn't hear yeah, the we screams. we did in the beginning, yeah. D.W., after the scene was done, said, oh my God, I didn't know you were gonna do that. He said, wait a minute, I got, I'll be back. He goes, he gets a reporter from Variety Magazine who just finished his breakfast, brings him back in, and he says, all right, do this again. She does the acting again, just as good as the first time. And as she said, he turned around, the Variety Report turned around, left, and lost his breakfast. Oh, my gosh. Because it was so severe. Right. People were very, like, just emotional wrecks. Well, that was the big controversial scene. And, you know, you, you, th you think of the strength of film critics. The biggest times for film critics were between the 1950s and 1980. Mm -hmm. But back then, it was the audience mm -hmm. who was word of mouth. And, of course, everybody went to the picture show because right. that's all you did. But people were never used to seeing that. Right. And even though I'm sure there was brutality, you know, because of the lowbrow type of people that were drinkers and everything, right. to see it on film, and it was so brutally done to the point where he beats her to where she's going to die within hours after it, the audiences were completely shocked by this thing. Like they thought DW took it, you know, over the edge. On the set of Broken Blossoms, D.W. Griffith developed a romantic relationship with Lillian Gish. As reflected in her 1969 autobiography, Lillian Gish, the movies Mr. Griffith and Me. Now remember, she was 27 at the time, uh -huh. not 15. So is that true or false? I'm going to just guess. Okay. False. You're right. No, there was no romantic entanglement with Lillian Gish and D.W. D.W. had a complex and sometimes scandalous personal life, and during the making of the movie, there were rumors of a romantic entanglement between Griffith and some of his leading actresses, such as Lillian Gish. Although Gish always denied a romantic relationship, the close working relationships with Griffith and intense focus on his actress fueled much speculation. Right. I thought he was too driven a person, if I just analyze it. Mm -hmm. He was too, like, Arr! and, you know, he wouldn't risk losing a star. <laughs> Birth of a Nation, 1915. The story is the Stoneman family finds its friendship with the Camerons affected by the Civil War, both fighting in opposite armies. North against the South. The development of the war in their lives plays through Lincoln's assassination and the birth of the KKK. Essential film. I'll tell you the ones you've got to see for silence. Trip to the Moon was one, and this one as well. The Night of the Hunter. A self-proclaimed preacher, Robert Mitchum, marries a gullible widow, Shelley Winters, whose young children are reluctant to tell him where their real father hid the 10000 he stole in the robbery. It's a Tour de force performance by Lillian Gish, mm -hmm. protecting these children. She goes against Robert Mitchum, who has love and hate tattooed on his hands. Very famous picture, directed by Charles Lawton, I must say, not directed well. The Passion of Joan of Arc. In 1431, Joan of Arc is placed on trial on charges of heresy. Was she a nut, or was she really 
a gift from God, like, you know, a beautiful film. The Cheat from 1915. A venial spoiled stockbroker's wife impulsively embezzles $10,000 from the charity she chairs and desperately turns to a Burmese ivory trader to replace the stolen money. Those are my watch lists. Broken Blossoms, critically acclaimed for its acting, for its use of cinema cinematographic techniques, uh, also criticized because of the violence, violence, the portrayal of Asians in movies, um, but had major influence on future movies. So Deb, where are we going next? You never know where we're going until we go there. See Aww. you next time. Aww. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you.